If there is one metronome in the history that humanity doubt even more than that of Beethoven, it is undoubtedly the metronome Robert Schumann used to set the tempi for his music. If you want to learn the true reason why it is that so many musicians and musicologists today don't take these incredible valuable pieces of information serious, stay tuned because I'm going to break this down for you with the example of one of Schumann's most known piano pieces. The Kinderszenen. So, hello everyone, my name is Wim Winters and welcome to Authentic Sound. This channel is all about looking in a new way to all kinds of authentic bits and pieces of musical facts that today oftentimes are overlooked but can be totally transformational for your own journey as a musician or music lover. And one of those things definitely are exactly the authentic metronome numbers or in other words, the tempo indications composers of the past gave to us musicians. They are almost by default entirely overlooked today since the speeds they suggest seem not real to us. That is also true for the metronome numbers Robert Schumann left. Hence the common story his metronome must have been broken, right? Now, the story of Schumann's broken metronome goes back a while, more precisely to 1855. In that year of 1855, one year before Schumann's death, Clara Schumann felt the need to undermine her husband's judgment for Tempi by simply stating that Robert was using a broken metronome. She backpedaled on this statement heavily in 1864 when she stated that there had merely been some minor differences between what she and Robert had in mind regarding the tempi for his works. Those minor differences are indeed shown in a comparison, for instance, between the metronome marks for the Kinderszenen given by Clara and Robert. But the harm had been done and the evil spirit never got back into the bottle. Today we see a renewed interest in these authentic metronome marks as true tempo indications. Publishers as Henle Verlag and Wiener Urtext have realized that the metronome marks are among the most valuable information we have from the past. It are impressive tools of knowledge helping us understand the true meaning of the works written centuries ago. Before we jump into the conclusions both Henle and Wiener Urtext make, let's compare the historic authentic metronome marks for the Kinderszene. You might be surprised to learn we actually have three complete sets, more or less directly connected with the composer's time. First, the MMs printed in the first edition. Though there seems to be no direct source to a written confirmation that the MMs for the Opus 15 are from Schumann's hand, Robert has seen them and being closely involved in proofreading his works and editions, he at a minimum has approved them. Michael Struck in the same Henle interview, they are authorized for Schumann did not correct them in, let alone remove them from any of the later editions, though he did make other corrections. Wiener Urtext basically states the same. Schumann never took offense at these metronome markings nor corrected them. In any case, the MMs as published still in Handle at the beginning of each piece, but stored back in the last paragraph of the last page in the critical notes of the edition by Wiener Urtext, are both in context and time extremely close to Robert Schumann, if not from his hand. And so, in the Instructive Ausgabe of 1887, that of Clara, we see a new metronomization for Schumann's Opus 15, this time from Clara's hand. As we have a set of numbers by Otto Böhme, friend of the Schumanns, written in his copy of the Kinderszene. So let's compare them and see how they correlate. What we can say is that all of these tempi are pretty close to each other. Only three tempi given by Böhme exceed the 25% compared to the possible Schumann tempi. And if we would take a 15% margin, Clara is still on board with 12 tempi out of 13. Only in one case she gives a tempo that is 18% faster than Robert's. All the other are below the 15% threshold. So how do Henle and Wiener Urtext deal with this? What information do they give to their musicians? 
Well, Handler does not speak about the other two sets of MMs, but in spite of the fact they validate the set of metronome markings of the first edition, they have Dr. Michael Struck give some questionable advice at the end. First, the interviewer suggests no more no less the whole beat practice could be a solution. He only uses some other words to describe the same thing. I quote, Could it be that Schumann and Böhme simply confused the reference value? For example, could they have intended eighth notes instead of fourths? For instance, Schumann set the tempo of the Traumerei at quarter note 100, a very fast tempo. Böhme went as far as writing quarter note 132. But if you divide that in half, namely eighths in place of fourths, then you are approaching today's tempo of the Traumerei. Reading this makes your heart beat faster since yes, there you have it. It is that simple. Develop that idea, Dr. Struck. But he does not. His answer is really disappointing, but also shows the struggle our musicologists have with these authentic tempo indicators. They simply don't know what to do with them. Hide them is no option, certainly not in the age of the internet. But coming up with an answer is too difficult either, it seems. I quote, that's an interesting hypothesis, but it doesn't work. For even Clara Schumann in her instructive edition set the tempo for Traumerei at quarter note 80. This quarter note 80, by the way, results still in a very fast tempo. And by the way, this tempo of 8th note 80, so Clara's tempo read in whole beat, is still perfectly normal today. Listen, for example, to Donald Trifonov's version played live a few years ago. Struck continues with the last advice that, with all due respect, makes no sense, let alone it would be helpful for the poor musician at his piano waiting for a solid answer. On the question if we should look to Schumann's original metronome marks more seriously, Struck answers, I urgently suggest taking a closer look, not by letting the metronome tick while one plays, but by attempting to play the pieces as close as possible in the tempo intended by Schumann. A point that appears important to me is also that Schumann noted several ritardandi. How can you really become slower if your basic tempo is already too slow? Now, not only our friend Trifonov answers already that question, but are we really sent to the musical forest with the compass on which is written that the indicated ritardandi will somehow explain the tempi of which the majority we feel make no sense at all? I hear Alberto answering already. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> with all respect for researchers like Dr. Michael Struck, but if that is all you can come up with, why not simply saying you have no idea? You don't know. There is a beauty. An inspiring beauty even in acknowledging that you don't have the answer to give. Wiener Urtext ends in a way that in spite of the incredible institute they are today must be called out to be a highly opinionated advice that might have the effect of sending an entire generation in the opposite direction of Schumann's musical paradise. In one paragraph, the author Joachim Dreiheim says not to take these tempo indications serious, but use them only to play as fast as possible. These markings will not absolve today's performers from finding their own appropriate tempi. Performers are advised against blindly choosing one of the three possibilities listed here. Although all three, notwithstanding their different way things, will generally serve to counteract the current widespread tendency to sentimentalize these works by dragging the tempi. First of all, in no uncertain terms, Drahai makes the case for Robert and Clara to be musical idiots. Sorry for the hard words, but what else is written here? Both have given Tempi that he feels the need to advise against using them. Would we dare to repeat that statement when Schumann would come back to give a masterclass on his Kinderszene? I don't think so. And furthermore, if the Kinderszene are also not allowed anymore to have a high portion of sentiment, which music still can? 
But it is beyond my understanding why Wiener Urtext the editorial board let a closing statement like this pass. Even going further and eliminating the MMs from the Kinderszene at all. For the first time since over one and a half century. How can they say the given metronomarchs do represent an historical situation, are historical facts, are correct? and yet at the same time advises strongly against using them, not even bothering to give one single reason why. And if that's not enough, after they threw three sets of authentic metronome numbers under the bus, they even go further by using them only for a free pass of speeding up any tempo that we might have today in mind for these wonderful miniatures of music. Citation desperately needed, I would say. So, what is our answer to these mysterious metronome marks? What would you think about some music? As Alberto Sanna already has brought to you the complete Kinderszene without any compromise to the MMs, as approved by Robert Schumann, he will record the same bundle again twice, once in Clara's tempi and once in Otto Böhm's tempi, both with the application of the WBMP. And that will be the answer to these mysteries of which the status of mysteries has been protected for way too long. The true reason we struggle so much today in accepting the WBMP as an historic fact is similar to what made Clara Schumann say in 1855 on the metronome of her husband. Yes, we feel obliged to the incredible minds of people like Beethoven, Chopin and Schumann. But when push comes to shove, we, in our time, are not ready to give up our individuality, our ego, our ability to show off at our instruments that we studied for so long and so hard. That is the real reason why we struggle with those authentic metronome marks. And that is the reason why institutes as the Wiener Urtext greenlights prefaces like this one. It takes courage to face facts and figures and resist the spirit of a certain time. And our time may today not be ready to face a musical historical truth in an uncompromised way. But tomorrow it will. There simply is too much power hidden in the music of that time. It will surface, and it will soon, thanks to music, as the incredible beautiful version of the Kinderszene Alberto Sana uploaded here on the channel, and which you can access by clicking on this thumbnail over here. And thanks to all of you who are watching these episodes, and even supporting the platform we built through our Patreon site. Thanks for checking that out. It really helps us keep going. And for now, thanks for watching. See you soon again. Bye.